Hi, and welcome to the Trusted Executive Podcast. I'm here with Dr. John Blakey, the founder of the Trusted Executive Foundation, which helps CEOs and leaders across all sectors around the globe create a new standard of leadership divine by trustworthyship. Now, John's work has been featured in Forbes, BBC News, HuffPost, and the Sunday Times. So welcome to you, John. Yep. Good afternoon, David. Good afternoon to all the listeners who have stuck with us so far. Fantastic. <laughs> As you said, this one is an afternoon one. We're going to see what the what it's going to be like. The energy on this one, John, and uh, those that have listened before will, will will already know that the idea of this podcast is to help you as listeners gain a practical understanding of the potential benefits of the trusted executive model to you through taking a deep dive with each of the nine leadership habits which underpin the model. Now, as I mentioned before, when you say in the book, John, you didn't just dream the, up these nine habits over a glass of red wine or even a few beers. They are a product of six years of evidence-based research at Aston Business School for your doctorate, involving over 500 board level leaders. With a deep passion, you offer the business world an academically rigorous and relevant answer to the question, how do I do trust and why does it matter? So John, from your research as an introduction to those listening, particularly for the first time, why should they care about trust? And in a nutshell, what did you discover in your research? Yeah, why should you care about trust? Um, I'm conscious that some people probably have listened to a few of these podcasts now, um, so I don't want to bore them with the same reasons each time. So I'm going to pull out a, a new reason why to care about trust for habit number five. Um, trust is is a, a magic wand. It's the one thing that changes everything. The, the thing I want to focus on just uh, to introduce it today is the impact of trust on high performing teams. And there's a piece of uh, work that was done by Google uh, called Project Aristotle. It took them two years. They wanted to answer the question, what makes a perfect team in Google? And they interviewed 180 teams, 37,000 employees involved in that research. And the answer that they came up with as what makes a perfect team surprised them. It wasn't the individual charisma of the team leader. It wasn't the technical brilliance of the analysts. Um, It turned out that the single most important factor was psychological safety or trust. So teams that develop psychological safety, in other words, teams that create a high trust space for their members are the highest performing teams in Google. So I think that's just another example of the importance of trust um, on another aspect of business, which is building high performing teams. In my own research, Again, I'm I'm thinking of different things I've shared on previous podcasts. Maybe the one uh, snippet to share today as an outcome from my own research is that on average, CEOs rate their own trustworthiness 29% higher than do the people that they lead. And so actually what that means is we're probably not as good at this trust thing as we think we are. And there is what I call an authenticity gap. That 29%, I refer to it as the authenticity gap, the difference between how trustworthy we think we are and how trustworthy everybody else thinks we are. And that authenticity gap is a risk, a reputational risk, because if you think you're more trustworthy than actually others perceive you to be, then that's potentially a blind spot. And so one of the aims of this work is to reduce that authenticity gap so that there is no um, gap between your own view and other people's view and interestingly links to that humble habit you know um, if you think you're 29% better at something than everybody else does probably <laughs> probably that's the not, not the, the most humble <laughs> position to uh, to adopt on that particular criteria so hopefully that's just a little introduction to the the benefits of trust and uh, and what came out of my own research. Mm, thank you John wonderful and of course as we record this podcast the whole issue of trust really is, is very um, high profile at the moment, particularly around UK government and can we trust what's being said? Is this true? What's happening? So it's no surprise really that this uh, habit number six that we're going on deep dive today, choosing to be humble, sits under the pillar of in- integrity because you mentioned authenticity and for me, integrity and authenticity, you know, sit together. And as I always say, actually, and I do, I truly love the fact that each habit starts with the word choosing so this as i said before this makes it very intentional for me and it's quite clear it's not a one-off as we're talking before we came on sometimes models can be used as a tick box exercise and one thing i want to just let the viewers know 
is a trusted executive really is something to be embodied. It's not a, a tick box exercise. And as you say, quite rightly showing it's not a tick box exercise, you say a habit is an accumulation of choices. So again, it's not one off. So for you, John, what is this habit? Number six, choosing to be humble. And what benefits does it provide for those who are listening in, in positions of leadership? Yeah, choosing to be humble feels a little bit ironic to be doing a podcast on choosing to be humble. You know, how can you do a podcast without an element <laughs> of self-promotion? Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that, um, that apparent paradox later when we talk about how this habit fits alongside other habits. But choosing to be humble, my, my, my favorite quote about um, humility and being humble which actually wasn't, isn't in the book, but I, I came across it actually after writing the book, but it's from C.S. Lewis, who said that true humility does not consist of thinking less of yourself, but consists of thinking of yourself less. Mm. Um, so true humility doesn't come mm. from thinking less of yourself, but it comes from thinking of yourself less. And, and I think humility and being humble, sometimes people think, oh, does that mean I'm sort of shy and retiring? Does that mean I've got low self-esteem? Uh, no, this isn't about thinking any less of yourself, but it's about the focus of your attention and efforts uh, in terms of um, focusing on your mission and the impact of your leadership on other people rather than that self-obsession and that self-focus. So I think that's an interesting way to think about being humble. And of course, another way to think about being humble is to think about the opposite of being humble. The opposite of being humble is being arrogant. Mm -hmm. And I often talk about the shift from the world of power to the world of trust. And in the world of power, where the, the currency of leadership was power, I think you could get away with being arrogant if you were successful. Mm. We might not have liked it, but we sort of tolerated it. Now, I think the big takeaway in terms of the risks here for leaders in the modern social age is that however successful you are, we still expect you to be humble. And there are examples that we see now of the reputational impact of being successful, but not being humble. I mean, the most recent I would highlight is the chairman of um, KPMG in the UK, Bill Michael, who's now the ex-chairman of KPMG. And the reason he's ex-chairman is that he was, um, clan, he was, he was captured in a, a town hall meeting on Zoom, which was recorded and then shared on social media and shared to the press of him acting in an arrogant manner where he, he was accusing the staff of moaning, he called uh, unconscious bias crap and, and things like this. And it's that, that sort of casual arrogance that then four days later led to him resigning from that role. And so one of the wake up calls for leaders around this habit in this day and age is that we are held to account, I think a lot more around being humble than we ever used to be. And the reputational impact for our brand whether it's the organizational brand or our individual leadership brand, there's much more risk associated with losing that reputation through a lack of humility than ever was the case in the past. Mm. So much there, John, so much wonderful stuff there. And I know we'll get in later in the podcast about what to do when things go wrong with, um, with the habit choosing to be um, humble. But one thing that came to me actually is we, I introduced it by saying that a habit is an accumulation of choices. And of course, here we're looking at choosing to be humble. But what struck me is probably it might be unconscious, but of course, choosing to be arrogant is no doubt an accumulation of choices. Um, so I hadn't really thought of that before. And that goes across all the habits. And, and, and what I also liked, I also liked when you looked at the reverse, you know, what's the opposite of choosing to be humble? It's choosing to be arrogant. And what came to me, because, you know, like yourself, I came through that patriarchal leadership where, as you said, leaders were allowed to be arrogant as long as they produced the results. What I noticed, and perhaps this sits in here with this habit, is in those cases, those leaders were about self-promoting this themselves. Quite often they were looking to get up the wrong next ladder, up the wrong, the next highest post. And what I noticed is they tended to um, create followers, whereas those that are choose to be humble tend to create leaders mm. and yeah. there's something and I've, I've written down in my notes here just the word there's something very empowering about that and I think that empowering nature with that humble leader as you said doesn't mean they're shy quiet retiring or don't say anything it means that actually I think they generate a, a 
a loyalty where they still challenge the, you know, the, the, those, those working alongside them still challenge them. There's a loyalty because that I think choosing to be humble generates that sense of, I love what you say in the book that actually in the game of chess, the king and the pawn go back in the same box at the end of the game. And I think that sums up what I'm trying to say here. Actually, I may well be, might well be the CEO, you may well be, you know, whatever role you have, but at the end of the day, <laughs> like the chess piece, we all go back into the same human box. Yeah, and, and, and I say to um, a number of my CEO clients that I coach, you know, remember before you were a CEO, you were a human being. Mm -hmm. And after you are a CEO, you will also return to being a human being. Um, so there is this um, common humanity, which I think is becoming increasingly important in leadership, that we want to be led by leaders who share our common humanity. And that, that relies upon letting go of the job title a little bit and embracing a bit more of that personal presence. Um, when you were talking about um, leaders, humble leaders, um, leading, developing other leaders rather than creating followers, David, that reminded me of a piece of work that I referenced in the book by, by Jim Collins, that the whole basis of his book, From Good to Great, and the model of level four and level five leaders. And again, like my own model, what I love about Jim Collins' work is it was based on uh, uh, five years of research. Uh, I mean, it's empirical research where he actually found that these level five leaders, as he called them, uh, generated more superior financial returns um, over a longer period. And there was a sustainability about that style of leadership. And the biggest difference between what he called level four leaders and level five leaders is this aspect of humility, he describes level five leaders as having a paradoxical combination of intense professional will and extreme personal humility. And that, that combination, which of course is habit one and habit six in the model, is a fantastic but quite rare combination to find in a leader. Whereas level four leaders, he would say are much more ego driven, less humble, they can deliver results, but the sustainability of that performance, particularly in a modern age, I think is questionable. And so this level five leadership is another way of thinking about this habit number six, choosing to be humble. And uh, Jim Collins' work from good to great, it's a fantastic resource for leaders who really want to explore, how do I both deliver great results and stay humble? Mm. Yes, yeah, so and, and I know that in your book, you, you pull quite a lot on the work of Jim Collins. I love that phrase, you know, extreme personal humility. And for those that aren't familiar with his model, I'm right in thinking, aren't I, John, that the level five, by well, the time he was writing, was the highest level of leadership that he, that he saw in, you know, in evidence at that time. Um, and I think there's something, this may be something that you've said, actually, that was in the book. You've said that when people are showing this, leaders showing this personal humility, you, I think it was you, you said that actually you found that people, when interviewing them, people spoke with a sense of reverence about them. Could you just explain a little bit about that, please? Yeah, I think the reverence is that it's it's rare to encounter it. And when you do encounter it, it it's it's actually humbling. It's humbling to see it in others when they are being humble. And, and the, the particular quote that you referenced in the book there, I remember the, the lady I was interviewing, the CEO I was interviewing, and she was talking about she used to work in the civil service and there was some scandal in the civil service. I think it was that time when lots of data records got 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 mislaid and released by mistake. And her boss at the time in the civil service resigned. Um, but she knew and he knew that he had nothing to do with that mistake. But he thought it was the right thing to do to fall on his own sword. And she said um, that she never forgot that moment and the amount of respect that she had for that individual um so you know this uh, and when she spoke about it you could tell yeah she wasn't just speaking about any old leader she was speaking about probably one of the top five people in her career that had inspired her and influenced her so this is the reputational value of being known for this habit and of course if you are humble it might be that it's a very personal thing. The world might not know that. But if individual people know it and have felt it in the workplace, then that is a very valuable gift that they've been given about 
an example of leadership. Mm, it, it is, John, and isn't it? It's actually wonderful that it actually has an impact on people and they remember. I mean, even to this day, and we're talking too many years and I care to remember, I remember I trained as a chartered accountant with what was then Arthur Young and it became Ernst & Young. So really big player. And you can imagine that as a youngster coming in from university and training, I was in awe, absolute awe of the managing partner, you know, because he'd been through it. He was on the office on the top floor. He headed up the, the big organization. And John, I'll never forget the, it must've been my, being my first or probably my second week of being there. I came out of the lift on one floor and there was the managing partner walking towards me. And there's me thinking, what do you say to the managing partner? What do you say? And this is true. He walked up towards me. He said, hi, David. He said, how are you settling in? And I, I was the classic gobsmacked, you know, I said a few words, I think. And then the runs around me, I said to others, how does he know my name? And they said, oh, they said he makes a point, actually, that at the start of every year, I mean, he's in Birmingham, about 30 new starters. He takes the photos and the names and he learns them and he makes a point of asking how they're getting on and connecting with them. And I think that for me is just a great example of choosing to be humble. Here's a senior partner who could have been arrogant and lord and it was asking me, <laughs> a new starter, how I was settling in. Yeah. No, it's, it's fantastic, isn't it? And you do remember it. I'm, yeah. I'm just, I'm just reading a book by Joe Biden. Um, the, the Joe Biden's book, Promise Me Dad. And in that book, he's just told the story about um, visiting the bereaved widow of a police officer that has been murdered. And he says to this um, police widow, um, "I'm going to give you my personal number, and I want you to call me." Um, he said, I have been through this because he's had a lot of suffering and loss in his own life. And he said, I've been through this. And, and I want you to know that if you ever want to call me, uh, you can call me. And then he says in the book that he has a list of strangers that he's given his number to that he's invited to call him. And he said they do call him. Mm. Um, and you're thinking, wow, this is at the time he was vice president of the US. This is the vice president of the US offering that to an individual. And then you think about the contrast between that humility and you know, can you imagine Donald Trump doing something <laughs> similar? Now they are both they are they are both presidents of the United States. So you know both have achieved a pinnacle position in leadership. Yeah. But you know who do you want to be? You know who do you want to be? You know what do you want your reputation, your legacy to be in terms of this habit? Because yes, you can uh, you know be successful for a period of time without embracing this habit. But I think if you want to build a lifelong reputation as a level five leader, then that's the aspiration that I hope the listeners have. And then this habit becomes a very important part of the toolkit. Mm. Thank you, John. I get a sense that those listening are actually maybe thinking about what examples they've experienced and how they can actually put this habit into action themselves in the workplace. And actually in the book you speak about um, because we've got you spoke with Joe, Joe Biden meeting with someone saying here's my phone number, and I had the sense that that maybe Joe himself realizes, okay, metaphorically I might be the king, they may be the pawn, but we're all the same humanity. And in the book, I'm really curious because you say that we all have level five seed in us as leadership. Um, so what do you what do you mean by that? And particularly, you wrote it on the humility, uh, choosing to be humble chapter. Um, so you see humble as a gateway. What would you like to expand a little bit on that? Yeah, I think the, the, the analogy of a seed, that we all have the seed of level five leadership in us. So as a coach, I, I believe in the potential of people. Uh, so I believe that the seed of greatness, the seed of level five leadership is there. Um, I'm not one of these people that think that level five leaders are born and, and you're either born that way or, you know, that's the end of it. I do think that the seed is there and that in the book, I therefore take that analogy and talk about under what conditions, in what environment does the seed decide to germinate? Mm -hmm. and, and because I think in my experience of my career, I've worked in many different cultures. I've worked with many different leaders and in the presence of some leaders and some cultures, the level five seed in me has germinated and felt nourished. But in the presence of other leaders and other cultures, uh, that seed has, has dried up and, and, and gone underground. And so I, I, I mentioned this in the book as a way of, you know, people think, okay, if I, if, I, if I think this habit's important, how do I get better at it? 
And a lot of the um, answer to that question for me about how to get better at being humble is to put yourself in the right environment, surround yourself with the right people because they will germinate the seed. They will nourish the seed of humility in you. Um, and that's one of the easier ways to develop this habit and to practice this habit. Mm, yes, and, and absolutely. And what also comes to mind, and again, those listening will go, oh, this is, because it's good. it really hit me, this point did. And in the book, you say, um, in regard of choosing to be humble, who are, who's around you? Because you say you are the company you keep. So that's an interesting thing to reflect upon. You know, I guess you're saying there, where you are in the organization, perhaps your leadership team or who you're working with, do they also, are they also striving to show this particular habit? choosing to be humble or not i guess the, the lesson is if the company you keep is arrogant it's <laughs> i think you say in the book you know it's human nature that will rub off on you is that is that is that your sense yeah i think um you know there's this uh, again i mentioned in the book there's this uh, i don't think it's scientific but there's this, this statement about you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with mm. um, and instinctively i guess that's that's probably you know that that's there's a lot of truth in that so are you surrounding yourselves with, with the people that are practicing these habits and particularly this habit of being humble? And if, if you're in a culture where you don't think you're surrounded by humble level five leaders, then are you outside of your day job uh, exposing yourself to networks, to leadership groups, to peer groups, to learning environments where you do bump into these people and where you do see that it's possible to be both successful and humble? Because I think seeing it is believing it. And when you are in the presence of these leaders, um, it, it's very inspiring to give you that alternative path that says, I can be both extremely successful and stay humble. And, and a lot of us, I think, have a belief that says that's not possible. And, and when you meet people who appear to be demonstrating that, it's a great way of challenging that limiting belief and, and empowering yourself to say, yeah, yeah this isn't easy but some people appear to be able to do it. So why wouldn't I be able to do it as well over, over a period of time? Mm, absolutely. And I think one, one final thing that came to my mind is, of course, there's now the opportunity I know I, I, I benefited from myself in, in industry is there was times when actually we're encouraged to have a mentor in the workplace, then coming back to choosing, <laughs> choosing to be humble, we can choose to maybe choose a leader that, that shows the habit of humility where we can actually uh, learn from from his or her presence as we're uh, being mentored yeah yeah but you do have to to work quite hard to find these people because again in the in the book i talk about the survey that we tool that we use which measures behaviors against all of these habits and we've now got a large database that benchmarks all those uh, behaviors and the lowest scoring behavior david of, of all the leaders that we've measured out of 27 behaviors the lowest scoring behavior is the behaviors that says other people would describe me as a very humble person. Mm. So what it demonstrates in that authenticity gap that I mentioned earlier, that, that gap between how others see you and how, how you see yourself, it appears from the data that there is a lot of scope for a lot more people to be recognized and known for being humble in positions of leadership. Um, so I think there's, there's a gap there. There's, there's an opportunity there. Um, if that's what people want to see in their leaders and you're the one that's practicing it, then that's how you stay relevant. That's how you stay, um, you know, impactful in, as I say, this, this modern environment. Mm, thank you, John. And um, we, we move on, actually, the, the sense of, it just come to me, actually, those listening to this, this podcast might be thinking, God, there's so many good stuff, so much good stuff in here. And I may well just throw out a challenge to say, well, maybe ask other leaders in your leadership team to listen to the podcast and have a discussion about how humble you are as a individuals and, a, and as a team collectively and how, how you're working to do this. Um, and on this practical nature, um, I think people are getting a, perhaps a real sense of what habit choose humble is, but from a, also from a deeper uh, practical perspective, um, we have Fiona Furman who's with us. And I've recorded another short interview with Fiona, the communications manager from the NAHL group. And they've, they've embedded the trusted executive model in the organization. So they're, they're striving to actually embody this work. So we're going to hear from her now, John, and how they've used the habit choosing to be humble. 
And as always, you've not listened to, not heard this interview. So uh, I do look forward to your response. So once again, I'm with Fiona Furman, the communications manager with NAHL Group, a group of consumer legal, legal businesses, including National Accident Helpline. As an organization, NAHL are using the trusted executive framework to empower the way they work and serve their customers. And today we're in the second pillar of trustworthiness, that of integrity, the extent to which we walk our talk. And we move on to the sixth leadership habit today of choosing to be humble. So Fiona, how have you used the sixth leadership habit, choosing to be humble within NHHL to make a real difference in your organization? Yeah, there's a great, um... There's a great quote that I know John is a big fan of and, and uses a lot. And I think it's C.S. Lewis where he says, um, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's about thinking of yourself less. And I think that's something we see um, an awful lot of uh, in our business, which I'm, I'm really incredibly proud of. And I think we just see it in, we see it in big ways, but we see it in, this, in the small touches as well, the kind of little everyday interactions. So um, I'm really aware that when, um, when somebody will say to one of our leaders, oh, you know, that's, that's great work that happened in your team. That leader will always reflect that back and say, yeah, the team did a great job. It will never be a matter of, yes, I know, because I did a great job leading them. It's always, yeah, the team worked really hard on that, or yeah, the team the team have, have really pulled that out the back. And I think that's so important because in, in many ways, it's about giving credit where it's due. Um, and it's about uh, putting, uh, putting that credit in, in the right place. And um, as I was thinking about it this morning, actually even doing this podcast has been part of seeing humility in action because when I was invited to take part I went to my director and I said listen I've been invited to take part in this podcast I'd really like to do it but I understand if it's something that you that you know you, you think somebody more senior you know a, a more senior leader should be involved in and the response came back immediately no it's great go for it and I just thought that there was great humility in that I think and um, it could have been really easy to say no that definitely needs to be one of our you know one of our top level leaders or we'll, we'll speak to speak to somebody really high up and get them to do it um, but I think it, it, it was a partly a reflection of the skill set that that my director acknowledged that I had um, and that I was a, I was a good person for the job but also just that humility of being able to recognize that and say actually I'm, I, I might be more senior but but it's good for her good experience for her but actually she, she's a good person to do that and I think um, when we see it we see it in all walks of life as well and I'm, I'm a I'm a football fan I'm a Liverpool fan and um we see it with Jurgen Klopp all the time you know he'll, he, he quite often says when the team play well that's on them when the team don't play well that's on me and it's that sense of responsibility of saying I'm responsible for leading this team when they perform well then then that's that's because they're they're, they're doing a good job and they're working really hard and they're doing their best if they're not what have I done what, what have I done in my leadership that means that they're not they're not doing as good a job as, as they could and I think that's what we see a lot um, at, at NAHL there's there's that humility and in, in our leaders looking at themselves a lot and saying right how can I lead my people better so that they can perform better uh, for the for the greater good. Thank you Fiona and I love the the empowerment sense of that and I was just going to say actually just this sense of I think within this framework is a sense of leaders develop leaders as opposed to leaders develop followers and there's a big difference I think between the two and just digging a little, little deeper into this what for you has been a personal insight or personal growth moment through using the choosing to be humble leadership habit yeah I think I think what I've recognized in in kind of thinking about it and and working with it and experiencing it is that there's a a, a large part of it that's also about having your teams back so so when you're humble it's it's about making sure that your team know that, that you have their back and it's about you know if there is criticism that comes their way um this is the flip side of it almost as there's two sides to every coin isn't there and it's a matter of being able to go okay so something hasn't gone right so so let, let you know let, let me protect my team in the first instance from from that attack but also let me let me work on that then and look and see get under the skin of what happened and how i can help and support them um to stop that situation occurring again or to help them understand um, their part in it and how they can they can perform better and so it's kind of the two sides of, of the same coin really and that's what that's what really struck me about it that sense that that being a leader and being humble is also about taking care of your staff it's not only about the good times it's about when when things are, are tougher as well mm, thank you yes and I think that's an important part of what I call well what is called psychological safety to be able mm. to be yourself so uh, so thank you, Fiona. I really appreciate your time and I appreciate your sharing today. And I look forward to what John has to say about this. So thank you. Thank you.
So, John, you hadn't heard that, but it blended in quite beautifully to what you got to say. So I look forward to so I look forward to your comments on, <laughs> on what Fiona said there. Yeah, well, I promise that I didn't plant the <laughs> C.S. Lewis quote with uh, Fiona, <laughs> but it's great to, to hear that quote uh, mentioned uh, back to me um, because, yeah, it is, it is one that I do use quite quite often um, and and it and it highlights that aspect of focusing on others and and as as um, Fiona was talking about how they do this in NAHL group you know I was reminded a bit of this uh, topic of servant leadership you know that there is a, a, as a strong link between this habit and servant leadership because you know um, Fiona's talking about serving the, the customers and, and putting the customer first you know and that that willingness to serve is all part of being being humble, and uh, she she actually very neatly described as well the um, when we were talking about James Collins and level five leadership, um, he talks about four attributes of level five leaders, and and if I if I just share these with you, you'll you'll have heard in what Fiona said, um, these attributes coming up in practice. So the four attributes are of a of a level five leader demonstrates a compelling modesty shunning public adulation and never being boastful. Second point, acting with quiet, calm determination and motivating others through inspired standards, not inspiring charisma. Third point, channeling ambition into the company, not the self, and so setting up successes for even more greatness in the next generation, which is your point about leading leaders and, and a leader who develops leaders. And the last one, looking in the mirror, not out of the window when apportioning responsibility for poor performance. And she mentioned Jurgen Klopp. And I think Jurgen Klopp, great example of a, of a humble leader that does exactly that, that he, he, he praises the team when they win and he looks at himself when they lose. And uh, it's a great example and hopefully one that people can readily relate to in terms of how that humility operates in practice. Thank you, John. And I know we seem to be very much in sync with um, Fiona today, and, and you've not heard that before. But I think those that have been listening to those listen to a few of these podcasts by now will get the sense of uh, Fiona and the work they're doing there. They actually are embodying the, these habits. As I said, I, I think introduced by saying they're not tick box. They're choosing to be intentional. They're, they're choosing to engage with these habits. And the conversations I have with Fiona it's quite clear to me that actually they, they're very practical to actually use in the organisation and they make a real difference both for her at depth and both for the teams that she's part of. So um, I am hope I think that, that comes across actually in, in the interviews. So I'm, I'm really pleased around that. And, and one thing you, you say, John, which is true here and ask you the question here, is that we're looking obviously at choosing to be humble, but this habit None of the habits actually work in isolation. So how does this habit, choosing to be humble, work alongside the, the other habits in the model? Yeah, we've already talked about how it works with deliver, that uh, this, this idea that there's a combination of intense professional will, that focus on delivery, and extreme personal humility. So there's, there's definitely that link to the habit number one about choosing to deliver. Interestingly, in the model, this habit sits next door to habit number seven, which we'll talk about next time, choosing to evangelize, mm. to spread the good news. And I often get asked the question when I do the workshops on the model, how can you both evangelize and stay humble? Good question. Because people think, oh, if, if I'm evangelizing, that must mean I'm blowing my own trumpet. And how can I do that and still be humble? And the way out of that apparent conundrum is to use Simon Sinek's very wise advice to start with why. Um, so if you start with why and you know what the mission is, what the grand cause is of the company or the work, then you evangelize on behalf of the cause and the mission, not on behalf of yourself. Mm. And that's what allows you to stay humble while still being a very proactive communicator and inspirer of visions and good news. So for me today, for example, I hope that people are listening to me thinking, John is passionate about trust. John wants to spread the good news about trust. Uh, he has a vision for that. And that's why he's using his voice to talk about that. So I hope that comes over rather than that John is choosing to big up John on behalf of John. Um, now, there will always be people that think I am doing that. And it, and, and it is, 
<laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to be completely um, pure in any of these things. But I hope that that distinction between being humble and evangelizing helps leaders who worry about how can I get on the front foot and be a great evangelist while still staying humble at a personal level. Absolutely. And thank you for that, John. That's really helped me because in 2021, particularly in, in the midst of the pandemic, as we've spoken on previous podcasts, we're seeing a lot of organizations really having a look at their meaning and purpose. So, of course, this ties in beautifully to this aspect of, you know, evangelizing, choosing to be humble. I'm actually speaking about meaning and purpose because it makes a difference to those coming back to serve that we serve, the, the clients, the customers we have. And of course, as part of that meaning and purpose, it actually means, I think, for me, that the, the members of the organization, the employees actually feel, actually, this is a place where I feel, coming back to my example in the lift, I feel understood. I feel that I belong. I feel that I'm making a difference by being part of this organization. And I've always said, you know, as part of my research, how wonderful that is. We can spend so, so long on connected with work matters we may be these days working from home on work but we're working on work matters so actually if we're working on work matters if we're working for work that does matter that makes a difference isn't that wonderful and this is where i see these habits coming in uh, and trusted executive model and really supporting that so you know so it's something i can see that through fiona you know as a closing one it's something that comes in and actually helps them you know when people are thinking well how do we do this it's like well actually we can work with this ah oh, okay, we can do that. So, you know, we talk about our <laughs> trust exec, you know, wisdom nuggets. Uh, and there's, I think there's just so many sprinkled through the book and you've shared lots on, on, on the various podcasts. So it's a really rich resource. Um, thank you, John. And speaking of rich resources, the section that I like having pulled together the podcasts, you've pulled, you've given us and people can go back and, and listen and look at the others. You'll see there's a, there's a number of list of resources and books and other things that you've said. So how can listeners get further resources on choosing to be humble? And what would you recommend that they actually uh, get hold of, John, to support this habit? Yeah, we talked about from good to great, Jim Collins. I think that's definitely the go-to reference for this habit. Many people will have heard of it and uh, it's a fantastic resource um, to be reminded of. If you've read it once, then it, maybe it's the time to read it again because it's just one of those books that mm. you can go back to. If you haven't got time to read Jim Collins' book, there is a Harvard Business Review article that he wrote, which has a fantastic title called The Triumph of Humility and Fierce Resolve. Wonderful. And uh, The Triumph of Humility and Fierce Resolve. And I think if you haven't got time to read a book by Jim Collins, then Google that um, HBR article, The Triumph of Humility and Fierce Resolve, uh, and that will give you a specific nugget just around this, this particular habit. So that would be my, my go-to um, resource. Uh, David, I mean, you, you can you can obviously learn about this habit, but as we said earlier, um, I think a lot of being humble comes with experience and with mixing with leaders who are role modeling this habit. And so that would be the other recommendation. Again, going back to what we said earlier is think about your network, maybe sit down and make a list. Who are the five people I spend the most time with? in a professional capacity. Are these the people that I want to be imitating? And if not, who might I plug into that top five that I could spend more time in and start making a choice to spend more time with them as a resource? Um, you can read books, but how about spending time with people? Because that's another way in which you learn and which you pick up new, new things. Mm, thank you, John. And what came to my mind is those listening can choose or back to choose again that maybe when they have their half yearly review or yearly review they may want to sit down and, and actually state this as an objective for them that they they want to choose to connect with them with this habit and actually find mentors or, or actually maybe even model it themselves but be vulnerable which we've spoken about before in saying this is what i'm choosing to do for perhaps this next six months because it is an accumulation of habits um, now we come to a part which actually I really love because um, it's, it's entitled what to do when things go wrong. So if you look today, John, you were, you were speaking opposite of choosing to be humble is to be arrogant. And you gave an example of what happens when, when that was the case. But, um, but again, in your book, you have the chapter cracks in the pillar, what to do when things go wrong. 
and I know that um, this this area here is you know we've, I've said before you're a pragmatist you walk the talk you want a failure but actually we want to see here that as you said before you know a zero score on any of these habits impacts across trust as a whole so what can a leader do or even an organization do when choosing to go humble goes wrong yeah I was thinking about this before the podcast um, and I was thinking about this example of Bill Michael at KPMG which I mentioned earlier because Bill Michael, after that town hall briefing on Zoom that went viral, he did apologize. And you sort of think to yourself, surely that would be enough. You know, he made an apology. Um, surely that's sufficient to put things right. But no, four days after the town hall, he resigned. The apology wasn't sufficient. And I was reflecting on this, you know, I think this is a habit that it's quite hard to recover from through an apology alone. I know of other examples where uh, leaders have been arrogant, they've apologized, but it still hasn't reset the perception. And if I had to say, okay, what is it that's going to reset that reputation? I'm thinking of a, a phrase that I uh, sometimes use, which is sometimes it's better to suffer than retaliate. Um, and I think with the habit of being humble, if, if you are found lacking in this, in other words, if you've been arrogant, um, and sometimes the, the, the temptation is to try to justify your behavior, the next step is to apologize for your behavior. The next step beyond that is to suffer for your behavior. And I think if there is apparent public suffering, I think that is often what um, uh, resets perceptions on this habit. If I think of an example, let's think of Dominic Cummings and his infamous Barnard Castle trip to Specsavers or wherever it was. Um, <laughs> Testing out his eyes by driving, yes. Exactly, and many would say well, it was a, he acted in a very arrogant way, thinking that the rules were for everybody else. What was it that saved um, Dominic Cummins from resignation at that time? I think when he sat in the Rose Garden, that, that bank holiday Monday in 2020, I think people saw that he suffered that he suffered publicly. He also apologized, but it was obvious on his face that this man was suffering. And I think because of that public suffering, which takes some courage, it takes some courage to put yourself into the, the you know, the sort of spotlight of public scrutiny in that way and to, and to apologize that publicly. I think that's what saved him. And so it might not sound a very um, easy pill to swallow, but I think, literally eating humble pie is the way to recover from a lapse in this habit and the more public and more the more difficult that humble pie tastes then the more likely it is that you will be forgiven for your lapse on this habit thank you john and maybe there is an added piece in there that, that i'm thinking of and that is that that i hear you on that that actually you're choosing to eat the humble pie and it may well be actually that also, as well as doing that, you're also reflecting on how you got into that position to start off with and what you're going to choose to do in order to rectify it going forward. That may be one piece that I think Dominic Cummings perhaps didn't do, um, because that then becomes, a, again, a more in, an embodied piece, because if, if the people see you suffering, then they can actually see you're choosing to actually engage in a different way then I think that ties together and people are going, ah, actually, in this case, he is, he actually is making an effort to do things differently. And, and perhaps then they connect with staying with his, they connect with his humanity. I think that's what binds us together, isn't it? That actually he might be a king, but actually he's a pawn just like me at the end of the day in the box. Alongside. Yeah. Yeah. So that glimpse of, of, of the, yeah the human being that's suffering because of this um yeah can, can be very um important in recovering from a lapse in in this habit yes now john you've spent a long time researching and developing this model and as, as we mentioned earlier you haven't just do this done this in order to just big up john although i can say you know you've had a continue to have an ongoing successful career as a leader and world-class coach. But I know that one of the main reasons that, that you're doing this is you're really passionate about the importance of trust 
And as part of this today, this habit, choosing to be humble. So this is the part of the podcast, part of the show where, where we dive a bit deeper. I know it's your favourite part. <laughs> but I just, just go a bit deeper under the bonnet, under the hood. I really just want to find out why does this habit, choosing to be humble, personally matter to you? And as you've said before, there are two levels behind this. So, yes, I will be inviting you to be vulnerable and explore both. Yeah, so the, the, the personal level and the, and the spiritual level, I suppose, around the importance of this habit to me. At a personal level, I think I did for many years in my career grapple with this challenge of how can I be both successful and humble? I think it is a wrestling match that I had in my career. And, and I think there were times when I, when I probably exhibited false humility. And what, what do I mean by that? I mean, I mean, holding back and not offering your full presence, your full voice because of a fear of being accused of being arrogant or, 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 or bragging or, you know, so not trusting our motivation and not trusting my motivation sufficient. So I think in the early part of my career, I, I was definitely shy around some of these things. Um, and it's only with a lot of help, um, you know, working with my own coaches, reading all the books that I've read and et cetera, et cetera, that over time I've grown more confident such that, you know, I can now write a book, I can deliver a conference speech um, and I can be confident doing that and still believe that I've got my personal humility. And that isn't to say that there aren't times when obviously we, we all get caught, caught up and carried away in the, in the occasion, the excitement of the moment. Um, but I think over time um, I've, I've recognized and become more confident that you can, you can do both. And that for me is a real gift to, to, to believe that's possible. And I hope it's also a, a gift to the listeners that they believe that that is possible. Um, so that's the one level, my personal journey. And then, you know, we always talk, uh, David, about the, the spiritual sort of aspect mm. of the timeless wisdom, if you like, of these, these habits. That it may be science in, in the 21st century, but it's, it's not wisdom that hasn't been there for much, much longer than that. And in my own faith, tradition you know as, as a christian then then obviously i always look to to jesus and 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 learning from jesus around each of these habits and the habit of being humble is a fascinating habit for us to think of in the context of the life of jesus and i, I was thinking about this before the podcast and particularly drawn to uh, one of the gospels mark chapter 10 verse 41 where what had been going on at this point with the disciples um uh, James and, and John had been vying with, with each other, competing with, the, with mm -hmm. each other to, to sit at the right hand of Jesus. And they, they were coming up to Jesus saying, Jesus, Jesus, you know, you know when, when you've done all your fantastic things, can we be the ones that sit at your right hand? Can, can you glorify us? And, and they wanted that, there was that arrogance. They wanted that sort of glory, that personal glory of, of being the right, right hand of Jesus. And Jesus sits them down and uh, he says this to them, um, Jesus got them together to settle things down. He says to the disciples, you've observed how godless rulers throw their weight around. And when people get a little power, how quickly it goes to their heads. But it's not going to be that way with you because whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. This is what the son of man has done, referring to himself. He came to serve, not to be served and then to give away his life in exchange for many who are held hostage. That's the, the message sort of uh, translation of the, or, or interpretation of, the, of that gospel. So you can see that at, at, at his heart, Jesus came to serve. He, he was a servant leader. And what he was trying to role model to his disciples who were struggling to get their head around this level five version of, of leadership. He was trying to say to them, um, your first job is to serve, not to be served. And this was challenging them to turn upside down their perceptions of what it meant to be a successful leader. So I think, you know, there's a huge amount of many, many passages we could refer to there, which show um, that habit of being humble uh, with, with Jesus um, and him role modeling that, whilst at the same time, him, him being extremely evangelical, as we said earlier, about having a vision, pursuing a mission, being very focused on that intense professional will and extreme personal humility. I think we see that in spades with, with the story of, of Jesus. 
We certainly do. And I love that, uh, how you put that into context for us, John. And um, again, what the example that, that, that comes to me is, because again, I keep hearing this phrase in body because, and I think it's true of all the habits, these habits are not just a, a cerebral piece of work. They're actually, you know, they're emotionally intelligent, they get grounded in body and it's how people are showing up in the workplace. And really for Jesus, we've just been through the period, or actually, do you know what, when we're recording this, the Sunday has just gone before this was actually Easter for the Eastern Orthodox Christian Church. So we've just had that. So of course, you know, the um, washing the disciples feet at the Last Supper, yep. was. you mentioned this on this podcast, you know, servant leadership was a great example of, of Jesus really being, being humble and truly sort of demonstrating that he was, he was here to serve. Because after, you know, as, as some commentators say, after a hot, dusty day out on dusty road, he is Jesus actually doing jobs that, that they would perhaps expect others to do, not their, their leader. Um, and I think one of the things that ties up with that as well, which because it's great how on this you see things in different ways. And this is actually sometimes when the leader, we always expect to take a leadership role in the sense of I've got all the answers, I'll do everything, I'm in charge. And one of the acts almost of humility by Jesus was, if you remember, almost towards, it must be towards the start of his ministry, he came across his cousin, you know, John, John the Baptist. And if you remember, um, John was busy baptizing people and Jesus came up to him and Jesus asked to be baptized by John, which is for me, was an act of humility. Of course, John at first said, no, no, I can't do it. And then Jesus then came back and said, yes, please baptize me. So you know, this is something, you know, close to your heart as well, but here's a great act of humility and that he put himself into John's hands and said please you know you will bapt please baptize me yes and it still didn't prevent him all that humility and humbleness still didn't prevent him saying I am the way and the truth and the life you know it still didn't prevent him from speaking his truth about who he was and what his mission was mm -hmm. so again in, in terms of seeing this juxtaposition of on the one hand the humility on the other hand the confidence and the resolute will to pursue mm. the mission. You, you know, you've, you've got him doing both. And I think that's, that's a really fascinating combination for people to, to examine because um, a lot of us are good at one and not so good at the other. Um, you know, and, it, and it's how do we do both in parallel that is the real, the real uh, world-class aspect of this, uh, this habit. Yes, and Jesus wasn't afraid. <laughs> he wasn't afraid of actually saying what he was thinking and feeling, was he, John? And I came across in preparation for this one I hadn't seen before, but there's a verse in John 5, which where he says, actually, I do not accept praise from men. Now, what it meant for me in the context of this, of course, he's, he's, I'm sure he was happy to accept, have praise and be told that was great. You know, we've done a good job here. But what the context was, was this is not my reason, raison d'etre. This is not why I'm here to have praise from men. He's like, I'm here to actually do the will of him who sent me. That was in the next chapter. So there's something beautiful about that that says, not that praise is wrong, but it's not was not the sole reason why he was the leader or he chose to be a leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the number one reason was he was there to achieve a mission. Yeah. So really, I mean, that's such a lot in, in, in this one here, John, of how, uh, it's so you know so relevant the examples that come out and then you can actually move that into you know leadership in in everyday life and um, one quick example I was going to give from mine from this is the Zen Buddhist actually Thich Nhat Hanh. and when I thought it I thought actually he was choosing to be humble here because in his community they sing they do although it's a Buddhist one but Buddhists sometimes don't sing songs they do sing songs and I remember one occasion where he chose a couple from his, I think, of his, his nuns and monks together. I think it took a couple of nuns to sing a song. And to be perfectly frank and honest with you, John, they were not fabulous singers. But what came through was actually the sheer joy on their face of actually singing. He had chosen to be humble, knowing that actually this was not going to be an exquisite, the best singing you've ever heard. But I tell you what it was going to be. It was going to be a heartfelt offering where he knew that by choosing to be humble, not putting on the very, very best of singing, but giving them the opportunity, there was something that actually, it was bizarre. Something came through that. It's difficult to put into words that, of how him choosing to be humble and not saying, I need the very best to sing. Something touched me and moved me. So that's another example, I think, where a leader can 
choose to be humble perhaps in, in what they're doing and it has an impact on those that are present yeah Right, John. Now you have looking at choosing to publish, published a book, Co Coaching Poetry from a Spiritual Path, where it says, whatever your own religious beliefs, these poems will challenge you to think deeply and inspire you to take the next step on your own spiritual path, your leadership path. So this is a stage, John, where I invite you to share from the book one of the poems that has touched you in respect of uh, choosing to be humble. Yeah. So I've got a poem here called Partnerships. And uh, this is a poem when I read it again this morning, I thought, yeah, this captures a lot of that spirit of being humble, working in partnership and uh, knowing that in a team, everybody has a unique role to play and a unique ability and a unique strength that they can contribute if the leader creates that sense of partnership. So here's the poem, Partnerships. Your turn to score the goal, not for competition or petty ties, but rather to humble me with your skill. Your turn to score the goal, not as a test or a silly game, not for anything more than to keep me an equal in your eyes. For I will not provide the help that creates dependency. I will not create a pedestal to deny you who you are. I will not be a great leader who diminishes the common spirit we share. Your turn to score the goal. My turn to pass the ball, not for lack of guts or selflessness, but rather to play a different role. My turn to pass the ball, not as a test or a silly game, not for anything more than to keep you as an equal in my eyes. For I love to watch you score your goals. I love to see you being who you are, creating a pedestal from which you will shout, my turn to pass the ball. Perfect, John, perfect. And such a beautiful tie up to, um, I didn't know you were going to share that particular poem. I've obviously got the book. What a great poem to actually link in with this, linked in, you know, with Jürgen Klopp and this aspect of, you know, choose to be humbled by your skill. Actually, as we said, you know, creating leaders, allowing people to flourish. What a beautiful, uh, you know, example of, of both leadership and choosing to be humble. And let's close on this, you know, isn't it what's come to mind, the power of choosing to be humble, hey? That's in, and, in, and where we where we're quite often it's being arrogant to having the answers seems to be the powerful part. I think what you've demonstrated to me today is actually choosing to be humble comes from a depth of power which brings people together. And as you said, serves then this mission and purpose which the people in the organization are heartfelt and driven towards to make a real difference in this world. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Now, I, as I will do, I'll put a reference to the coaching poetry from a spiritual path, a link below. And <laughs> you've spoken about Joe Biden giving his number out to various people. I won't ask you to give your telephone number out, but, but John, how can those listening discover, connect with you, discover and explore the nine habits of trust, perhaps via a keynote or walk, workshop or newsletter? What's the best way of people getting in touch with you is my question. Yeah, I think um, LinkedIn uh, is a great way to uh, to connect, and I will always, uh, you know, be very uh, uh, efficient at, at responding to any um, connection requests on LinkedIn. Always, always happy to sort of get connected in that way. Um, we have a website www.trustthexecutive.com, and people can contact us through that. That also lays out how we help people with going on this journey of trust. Uh, if, if people intrigued to go further and take their organizations further. Um, so I think those are the ways to, uh, to get in touch. And um, there is a YouTube playlist, um, Trusted Executive YouTube playlist, which has, I think, about 50 videos on now, um, which are all snippets of different habits, different aspects of this work. So I hope there's a huge amount of resource out there, which David, um, you know, your podcast is, is adding to, which is fantastic. Um, so I hope there's a lot there for people to go at and by all means get in touch if, if you want to explore this and apply it more specifically for your leadership, your organization. 
Mm, thank you, John. And, and I really appreciate uh, the way you're stepping out in the business world for this, because I really do believe that now is the time to, to lead with trust. And, um, and I know you have such a real heart and passion for supporting businesses to be the best they can regarding trust. So as we draw this podcast to a close, I invite you to say a few closing words to those listening. Yeah, uh, you are the company you keep. I think that's probably the part in the part in shot on this habit. You are the company you keep. Therefore, be very careful uh, with the choice around who you spend your time with, uh, who you're sort of um, rubbing shoulders with in terms of leadership. Um, the easiest way to build these habits, any habits, but particularly this habit, is to mix uh, more and more with people who are doing this better than better than, than you are today. Mm. Thank you, John. And uh, next time, habit number seven is choosing to evangelize. So until next time, may those listening, may you all have a wonderful day. And thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs>